weekly Bible study. We are in Genesis chapter number 29. Of course, last week in Genesis chapter number 28, we read about the famous story of Jacob's ladder, uh, which was the dream that Jacob had. It was given to him by the Lord. God will often do that, give visions and dreams to people that have meanings about things. This was in the middle of his travels to the land of Nahor, of course, going to his, his uh, mother's uh, uh, family is where he's headed. <clears throat> and that is as a result of him supplanting his brother Esau for his blessing. He first took his birthright and then afterwards supplanted him for his blessing as well. Here in Genesis chapter number 29, it is actually the, the uh, record of Jacob arriving in the land of his mother's kindred. So look here with me in Genesis 29, verse number 1, and we will jump right in. The Bible says, Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. Now, right here in verse number one, we find something very interesting. It's a Bible study, so we want to understand our Bibles. Oftentimes, uh, uh, people will try to identify the location or the area that the wise men were from, because where does the Bible say that they're from? It says they came from the east. Well, if we're going to use the Bible's definition, where is he traveling to right now? So this is a possible candidate, where the, the area of Nahor Haram, where he's traveling to right now is a possible candidate for where the wise men came from because it's the exact same language that is used. It says here that he came into the land of the people of the east. It says the wise men traveled from the east, right? That's where they came from. That's where they're from. So it's possible that they lived in this particular area, which is uh, located near Syria. So it's not as east as we would think. I've heard Asia. I've heard the wise men. You'll even see drawings where they look oriental, yeah. right? But you don't know that. If we use the Bible's definition, they could have just been from Syria. That's possible. Look at verse number 2. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a great stone was upon the well's water. And thither were all the flocks gathered. And they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. So that was the practice they would, that they would do there. Verse 4, And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? Whence means where are you from? <coughs> from where? My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we? Verse 5, And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. Now, real quick, just to refresh, make sure everybody's still keeping all of this in their minds. Does everybody remember who Haran and Nahor are, right? It's Abraham's brothers. They're all the children of Terah. Now, what's interesting about verse 4 and 5, we put them together. They say they are of where? They say, of Haran are we, right? Well, this is the land where Laban's living. This is where, who is from? Rebekah, okay? I want you to back up to uh, chapter 24, verse number 10. Chapter number 24, verse number 10. This is the chapter when Abraham sent his servant to find Rebekah. Well, he didn't know, of course, that it was Rebekah, but to find a wife for Isaac, and it was Rebekah. <clears throat> he was sent there to his, uh, his father's land, the land of his nativity, which is the same land of Rebekah. Look here at verse number 10. It says in verse 10, And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master <coughs> were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. So notice this city is referred to here in verse number 10 as Nahor. You skip forward. Go to verse number 4 again. 29.4, one more time where we were. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? It says, And they said of Haran, are we? Now, Rebecca is very clear that she is sending, um, here in this case, Jacob back to the same land, the same land of her nativity, right? So there's one of two things this could be. They could refer to this land as Haran and Nahor, just one and the same. Or this is even more likely that these particular people are of Haran, that they are actually of Haran and Nahor and Haran are adjacent cities, that they are right beside one another. And you can actually look at examples of this where land is settled and it'll be by, by uh, brothers. And let me give you the most common example, the whole nation of Israel. They settle next to one another and they're all brothers and you have 12 cities that are all next to one another 
You know, you have the Levites, obviously, everywhere. They're next to everybody because they're in these cities that are within suburbs where it's like in, in uh, uh, you know, being encompassed by another, you know, uh, 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 city-state, if you will, of one of the other tribes, right? So that's a perfect example of it, but there are other examples as well where they'll just be next to one another. So uh, what makes the most sense probably is Nahor and Haran. They both settled next to one another. They named their land the same as one another. Or, or uh, they, they, they wanted to live in the same area and named their land after their own name. And Nahor and Haran are of the same area. Whether it, you, know, you live on this side of the border, it's Haran. Whether you live over here, it's Nahor, right? So that's probably why they would interchangeably refer to this, this close by area as either Nahor or or Haran. They're adjacent to one another. Look at verse number 5. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. So look at verse number 7. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day. <coughs> Excuse me. Neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. That's referring to the sheep. Cattle refer to the sheep as well. Uh, water ye the sheep and go and feed them. Verse 8, And they said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Now all the flock, they're waiting for all the flocks to be gathered together. There could be a couple of reasons for this. Number one, they could be waiting for all of the men that are the shepherds of each, you know, uh, 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 individual flocks, right? Maybe this is a, a, a large rock and they like to all do it together and all move the rock together. If it's that large of a rock, it may be too cumbersome uh, for one person to move it. Or, it could be uh, that they like to, for all of them just to get together. Maybe they're afraid of something getting in the water, something falling in the water, so that they can all real quick drink of the water and then close it. If you take theory number one, if that is true, the, the rest of the story ends up being very interesting. Because if you look down at verse number uh, nine, it says this, And while he yet spake with them, <coughs> Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. So Rachel was the shepherd of her father's sheep. Verse 10, and it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So, of course, this is his first cousin is who Rachel would be. And he sees her. He, uh, he, like it says there, he runs to her. It says he went near and then it says that he rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock. I started to get ahead there because I know what the next verse talks about. So, he watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So, notice that he moved the, uh, the, the stone or the rock out of the way. So, if it is actually that they like to all do it together, that tells you this is further proof that Jacob is not, when it talks about being a plain man, that he is not. It's not saying that he is effeminate or that he is a, a sissy because he himself was able to go when all of these men like to do it. He, he, in this case, uh, you know, would have moved the entire rock by himself, if that is what's going on here. Then you see verse number 11. <clears throat> this is what I almost uh, uh, quoted. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. So we see that he, he, he kisses her and he you know, lifts up his voice, talks about him, it's, it's saying he's crying out. And then it says that he wept. So he's so excited or so happy to see her. You know, this is the way that he responds. Look at the following verse, verse 12. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother. And then he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. Now, especially it being a Bible study, verse number 12 is very significant. Because what is Jacob's relation to Laban? What is it actually? What would he be? His nephew, exactly. He would be his nephew. He, Laban is Jacob's uncle, and Jacob would be Laban's nephew. But if you look at verse 12, it says this, <coughs> And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother, and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. Well, this is important because there are times in the Bible, especially people that do not believe the King James Bible is perfect, well, they will try to attack the Bible, where the Bible will refer to a relationship between two people 
as being a brother. And when, and, and people will try to point this out, the James Whites of this world and everything, you know, that think that they're smarter than God, and they will, they will say that this is an error because they are not actually brothers, they have this other relationship, whatever it may be. And there's a couple, I think there's two or three instances of this actually in the Bible. This, what this proves is that they actually are ignorant of the Bible's language. Because the Bible will refer to those that are of the same tribe or closely related in a family as being brethren. That's all that this is saying. You know what people will, will call one another within the entire nation of Israel? He calls them your brethren or your neighbor. That's what this is referring to. That's why he's saying my brother. That's why he's calling him his brother because they are very closely related. So you can see, this will help you understand the Bible. Maybe if you come across, like, why did he just call him a brother? Just keep that particular point in mind that you can see here that Jacob refers to uh, Laban as his brother when they're not actually, you know, uh, brothers as in of the immediate family and sharing the same mother and father immediately, right? Look at verse 13. It says this, And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him, and embraced him, and kissed him, and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. So you see the great joy, <coughs> number one, excuse me, that Jacob had when he saw Rachel, who was of his brethren, if you will, right, of his same family. And then again we see the great joy that Laban has when he hears about Jacob, and then when he gets to see Jacob. There's great joy... When he gets to see Jacob's face, when he, even when he heard about Jacob himself, right? It says there at the very end, and he told Laban, or I'm sorry, right before that, and he kissed him and brought him to his house. I mean, that's great affection is what I wanted to point out. That's a, that, that shows the, the, how, how uh, you know, happy and excited he is to see him, that he's kissing him. He's showing great affection because he has great compassion about this, right? One thing that we can learn from this particular point right here, it, from the great joy that Laban had when his brethren returned back to the land of their nativity, how much greater joy should you have as a Christian when your brethren return back to their land of nativity? They return back to maybe church. They return back to fellowship with God. Go to Luke chapter number 15, verse number 11. We can see a spiritual application here. Luke chapter number 15, verse number 11. <clears throat> Luke chapter number 15, verse number 11. <coughs> this is Jesus speaking, telling a parable. It says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, they arose, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent, and he sent him into his fields to, to feed swine." <clears throat> And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And he came to himself, and when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, <clears throat> and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But he, when, he was, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Doesn't this sound very similar story? <clears throat> Verse 21, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat 
and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Keep reading here. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things mean. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I may make merry with my friends. <coughs> But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Now this is an extremely powerful parable. There's a couple of different applications that we can take away from this. I've proved this already and I'm not going to do this tonight, but the primary application actually is speaking about Israel and the Gentiles. That's the primary application of this particular parable. But the, the, uh, the application that a lot of people will preach, which is, is also true because Scripture is very deep. There are, there's multiple meanings and you can prove that, that, that a parable or a story will have multiple truths that you can glean from it. And another great truth that we can take away from this is the attitude that we should have when a brother leaves the church or maybe leaves you know, uh, his spiritual walk with God. Now, he's not being lost in the sense of losing his salvation because once you are saved, you are always saved. You can never lose your salvation. Just because you stop coming to church doesn't mean you're going to go to hell. Just because you stop walking in the light or living a righteous life or maybe you start walking after the flesh, that doesn't mean you're going to go to hell. You know, that just means you've just become a disobedient Christian. You're still God's son, now you're just one of his disobedient sons. So, that is a good application to this particular story here. Notice he was still his son, right? He would have left. That doesn't mean that he's lost in the sense of losing his salvation. You could say that he's lost out in the world, right? But that's not the focus in the first place. What we should be learning from this is the moral of the story, we have two brothers here. One brother strays away, right? He's a, like the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's lost. He's out in the world. He's living a sinful life. And you know what? That brother ends up coming back. He comes back to the fold, if you will. He comes back to the flock. He comes back to the brethren. The appropriate or, or righteous response would be happy and excited to see him. Like I preached about Sunday morning, this past Sunday morning that is, we need to reach out to them anyways. We need to be trying to restore such in one in the spirit of, of meekness. That's another uh, you know, a truth that we can apply to this right now <clears throat> in context of the week. But furthermore, we need to love our brothers and our sisters. And when someone comes back, we should not treat them any differently. When someone comes back to church, we should be just as happy as, they, uh, as we were when they were here before. We should love them just the same. Now, of course, you know, you can use spiritual discernment. Maybe if they got into some horribly wicked, wicked, evil sin, when they come back, of course, be discerned about uh, or have discernment about, you know, uh, uh, the, the situations you put yourself in while you're with that person in the beginning. Of course, you know, you need to have wisdom, but you need to love that person and be happy that they're back. You shouldn't just say, hey, you know, they got into a life of horrible drunkenness, you know, you know, they shouldn't be allowed back at church, right? No, that's not what the Bible teaches. When Paul wrote the follow-up letter to the church at Corinth, he was happy that he was coming back. He was happy that this person was coming back. That's the attitude we should have. We should be happy that they're found again. We should be happy that he's back to the fold and living a righteous life. Just like Laban was excited and happy to the point of where he's kissing him, you should be that excited and that happy. If that is how happy Laban was to see his physical brother, how much more should you love those of the spirit that are of your brethren, that are your neighbors according to the spirit, even more so than the flesh? We're all related in some way or another. Hey, you know, family is important. 
But your spiritual family, physical family is important, but your spiritual family is far, far superior. Your spiritual family is far, far more important. You have way more in common with your spiritual family than physical family that's not even saved. Way more in common. Our church family should be, you know, our, it should, that should be our primary focus. Of course, outside of your spiritual family and your, uh, that is your immediate family, but your church family should be overall who you love. That should be who is, you know, takes, uh, you know, a premacy in your life. The, your, the, you know, back to the importance of church. That's one of the reasons why. You know, all these people that, that, that um, you know, that are down on church and, and they want to attack, hey, you know, it's not that important to attend church this, this amount of many times or that amount of, t- that amount of times. This, you know, you could go however often they want to say, once a month, whatever they think, whatever they think is, is you know, them, you know, uh, within the bounds of not forsaking the assembly of themselves together. Everyone falls. Everyone, every person in the Bible has some major collapse in their life. Some sort of detrimental time in their spiritual walk. You're not some superhero Christian, friend. You will have bad times in your Christianity. You're not greater than David. You're not greater than all the stories of all the Christians and all the Bible. But do you know what saves you when you do fall? The fact that you have a Christian family. The fact that you have a church home. The fact that when you start getting into sin, you'll have another brother who's there to be your watchman. He's there to help you and to take an account for you. He's there to be there for you and to, to restore you in the spirit of meekness. Instead of, hey, you just, you're just there by your family. You're just teaching your family. We don't have a church family. You know, my own family is. I'm the pastor of my family. And you just preach to your family every week and you do all of these things and everything together. You do communion together. You do all of these things together, whatever it may be. And you know what happens? In five years, six years, when one of you, let's say one of the adults, has some horrible spiritual decision that they make. And they start backsliding because of it. They have some major slump in their Christianity. Now they have no one to help them. They have no one to try to pull them out of that. (laughs) They have no one there (coughs) that's going to try to bring them back to the faith. I mean, imagine not having a spouse and being in a situation like that. I mean, mean, imagine that. You know, imagine not having, you know, anyone at all. You see, the importance of church is what you should see. The importance of having other brothers and sisters that are happy when you come back. If anyone ever joins this church, they fall into sin and they return in a year, you should be happy. You should meet them at the door with with hugs and kisses, just like Laban met Jacob. You should meet them just like the father met the son, running to him, being excited, being happy that he's here, being happy that he came back. Not, Not just having this attitude of just looking down upon him like, I know what you were doing, you wicked evil. They're gone for like two weeks, you stinking monster. No, I'm just kidding. But looking down upon someone, even if they are gone for a couple of years, even if you know that they fell back into sin, hey, what they did was wrong, but you need to love them and you need to care about them. You need to restore such and one in the spirit of meekness. You need to be happy that they returned. Go back to Genesis chapter number 29. Genesis chapter number 29. So we see there the importance, even... (coughs) The importance of spiritual brethren above (coughs) our physical brethren. If Laban rejoiced in such a way when he saw his physical brethren, how much more should you rejoice when your spiritual brethren return back to the flock or to the fold? Look at verse number 14. It says, And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. You can apply that to us being of Christ's body, the body of Christ. You know, they would, uh, our, our brethren that were, would, to, would leave, they would be of the same body and flesh as us, the same bone and flesh as us. Verse 15, And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, notice what Laban referred to him as, and that's, that, this would be his nephew specifically that he's speaking about. Shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? So he's letting him choose how much he's going to be paid or what he is going to be paid. Look at verse 16. And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Now it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what tender-eyed 
means, right? It's being contrasted here. It says, Leo was tender-eyed, but, that means it's negating, it means it's the opposite, but Rachel was beautiful. And obviously Jacob is interested in Rachel because she's beautiful. So what does tender-eyed mean? means she's ugly. She's not beautiful. Now, specifically what I believe that it means when it says she's tender-eyed is, what does it mean when someone's beautiful? It'll oftentimes say in the Bible that she is, uh, that, uh, that she is, what is it, how is it worded? Well to look upon, something along those lines? Something worded like that. It's talking about how it, it is for your eyes to look upon someone else. Well, what is tender-eyed? What does it mean when your, your eyes are tender? means it hurt. I don't know if anybody's ever thought this through before, but it means your eyes hurt. It means like you're like, oh, Leah, like, like she's ugly is what it means, like that ugly. It's trying to contrast the two things. Tender-eyed like she's so ugly that it hurts your eyes. It's literally, that tells you that this is the Holy Spirit, that Leah is not pretty at all, that she is very unattractive, but Rachel <coughs> is beautiful. So what is Jacob seeking after here? What is he seeking after? Beauty. He's seeking after beauty, isn't he? I want you to keep that in your mind. Look at verse 18. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Verse 19. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. So notice Laban is also, uh, he, he, he's very keen to the idea of, of his family, his children marrying other children that are of the same family, and that's because they're serving the same Lord, okay? Uh, it's important to, to, for our children to marry other Christians. <clears throat> I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter number 31, verse number 10. So it said, Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful. So we can see that Jacob was seeking after beauty, that that was what he was interested in. Not only that, Jacob was willing for to serve, that is, seven years for Rachel. That tells me that, that Jacob obviously understood the importance of having a good wife. The importance of having a good wife. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 18, verse number 22 reads, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. That teaches the importance of having a good wife. The value of having a good wife. <laughs> Excuse me. You're in Proverbs chapter number 31. This is, of course, the passage about the virtuous woman. A virtuous woman. Look at verse 10. It says this. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above ruby? So notice the value of a virtuous woman. Now, does it say a beautiful woman? No, it says a virtuous woman. It's talking about her values, the virtues that she has. A woman that has Christian principles or biblical principles that she is living her life by. Notice that that's what is important. Now, Jacob had his values backwards, didn't he? He had his principles uh, you know, uh, uh, wrong, his preferences, if you will. He was looking after a woman that was beautiful. That's what he was looking for when he should have been looking after a woman or looking for a woman that was virtuous. That should have been the most important thing. Look at verse 11. The heart of her does safely, um, yeah, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Now stop right there. Those that are already familiar with Leah and Rachel. What did Rachel do for Jacob? She caused him a lot of trouble from beginning to end. Rachel caused, and we'll get into this, and I'll, I'll bring up this passage, particularly this, this, this principle that I'm preaching right now when we get to that point, but, but Rachel caused Jacob a lot of trouble. It's not just because she was beautiful, but obviously, and we'll see in the very next chapter, a major problem that she had, she was just beautiful, and she had a lot of problems. Now, there's nothing wrong with finding a beautiful wife that is virtuous. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But when we choose out a wife, it should be because she's virtuous. That should be the reason why we choose out a wife. I want you to look at the very end of the chapter. Look at verse Pro Proverbs 31. Look, look at verse uh, 29. It says, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at verse 30. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So notice, 
Favor is deceitful. What does it mean, favor? What is a common word that we would use today that is synonymous with that? Popular. Popularity, right. Popularity would be like favor. If I would, you know, uh, 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 in that tense and everything, I would say popularity as a noun. You know, popularity is deceitful, isn't it? Popularity is deceitful and beauty is vain. Ultimately, beauty is vain. Do you know why? It's vanity. It's nothing. Do you know why? I'll give you a perfect example. Oftentimes, things that are vain in the Bible, it will talk about them being nothing. It will talk about uh, all, all of the world. You know, everything in the world is nothing. Do you know why? Because it appears for a little time and then it's gone. Everything you see is going to burn up one day. And guess what happens to your, to your beauty? You have it today and it's going to be gone. You know, Sarah, uh, evidently, that wasn't true, it, it seemed like. Because she was beautiful when she was like 90. I'm sure there came a time probably, you know, later on in her life. But either way... Today, what is applicable to us for sure. You may be beautiful today. You might have been beautiful 10 years ago. You might be beautiful in 10, 15 years. But you're not going to be beautiful when you're... I'm sorry to break it to you, all the ladies. You're not going to be beautiful when you're 85. You're not going to be beautiful when you're 90. You know, you may... Have, I'm sure your husband can still look at you and say, you're beautiful. But it's a different kind of beauty. It's not the kind of beauty of young age. It's not the kind of beauty of, that God gives to a lady when she's young. It's not the same. Beauty is vain. It's here for a little time and then it's gone. Looks, they're, they're deceitful. Favor is deceitful. Popularity is deceitful. Do you know what that tells you? Don't spend time on it. Don't, spend, don't just you know, uh, consume your life with how you look. Because it's only going to be here for a few days. And then when that's gone and you wasted all of your time on it, now you're left with no looks. Nothing you can do about it, right? Everybody's thinking, now all the ladies are like, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I know how important that is to women. Then they're, 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 they're old and wrinkly and they're not virtuous. Think about that. That's important. Now, so what matters? What really matters? Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. It's very interesting that, that I believe, go back to uh, Genesis again. Go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter number 29. Look at verse... Um, Look at verse 17. Very end. But Rachel was beautiful and well favored. What does that mean? It means she was popular. That's what that means. She was beautiful and she was popular. That's what that means. That beauty is what? Is vain. That's true, right? And the favor? It's deceitful. <clears throat> Further on that point, and we'll read about this later, of course. Who did, does anyone remember who Jacob was, uh, ended up actually being buried by? Leah. Yeah. Leah. Uh, obviously, Rachel, you know, uh, Jacob chased after Rachel for, for uh, you know, uh, th th these seven years and then another seven years. And, uh, you know, seemed to be very hung up on her for a very long time. But, if it be true, when Rachel and Leah, you know, uh, became much older... And let's say that Leah was the one that was virtuous and Rachel no longer had her, her beauty. How true would that statement be? Who do you think Jacob wanted to spend more time with? Who do you think Jacob wanted to be around? Being a man of God and, 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 Leah, and, and Rachel having her problems with idols as we're going to see and all of that? Who do you think? You know, a lot of times the very, very beautiful woman ends up being trouble as well. That's not always... That, of course, in my case, that's not true. No, it is true, baby. No, but you know, he, a lot of times the uh, the you know the woman that's you know, the prettiest at school or something, she's the most or one of the most biggest troublemakers at school. One of the more troublemakers at school as well. Isn't that true? And then you grow up and it's all gone. It's vain. The younger girls need to think about this too. Being consumed with your looks, they're only going to last for a while. That's why you don't spend your life being consumed with that. Amen. It'll be gone in the blink of an eye, and now you're left you know, with maybe possibly a sinful life or even just a wasted life and nothing to give to Christ. And that's why we need to focus on the things of, of Christ, the spiritual things, the things that are not seen, right? The things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. The soul, the virtues of, of man. Look there now in verse number... 
uh, 29, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Verse 21, And, and Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. One thing that's, that's good to point out here is, is the great self-discipline that Jacob had. The phrase, of course, go in unto her, is referring to doing what married couples do, doing what Adam and Eve did and causing Eve to conceive and bring forth a child. So that means seven years he was living in the same country and in, in, in this land with Laban, <coughs> and he was chased the entire time. He refrained from having a physical relationship with his soon-to-be wife, Rachel, didn't he? shows the great self-discipline that he had in this area. Today, of course, this moral or this, this virtue, if you will, is, is, has been completely forsaken. The importance of being you know, a virgin and chaste on your you know, uh, uh, honeymoon or, or, or day of your vows, if you will, your wedding day. That's what I was trying to think of. Goodness sakes, your wedding day. That has gone out the window. People don't act like it's important anymore. It's extremely important. Amen. Jacob was willing for seven years, seven years to wait on his wife while he's living in the same land. And he said, seven years is up. Give me my wife that I may go in under her. That tells me that most likely, at least, if he wasn't lying to him, that he, he waited for seven years. While he knew we're going to be married in seven years. Seven years from today. Can you imagine that? The self-discipline that it took him, right? That, you know, that shows the importance of not fornicating to Jacob. Why else would he have done it? Because he wanted to be obedient to God because he knew that it was sinful and it was wrong and I shouldn't do that. I should refrain from that type of relationship. And he did so. We need to instill in our children, just like I'm sure um, uh, Isaac did in Jacob, Abraham did in Isaac, Isaac did in Jacob, the importance of being a virgin when you're married. It's extremely important. All of our children, that should be. Today it's just like, up. Oh, you know, nobody is, so what's it matter? No, it matters. Amen. I don't care what the world's doing. Right. I care what the people of God are doing. I care what God's commandments are doing. Even if God, let's say the people of God start, you know, straying away and they don't care any longer, which in a lot of churches they are. I don't care what they're doing. Yeah. You know, I care what God's commandments say. That's what I care about. Amen. That's what matters to me is what God says. If God says, hey, fornication is wrong, it's evil, it's sinful, it's wicked then it's wicked, it's wrong, it's sinful, you shouldn't be doing it. Amen. If you've got to wait seven years while you're working, maybe even living in the house with Laban the entire time, then wait seven years. Wait as long as you have to wait. That's how important it is. It doesn't matter. Look at what it says in verse uh, <coughs> uh, 22. And Laban gathered together <coughs> all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah. Now is that who he was supposed to marry? No, it was, it was uh, Rachel, of course. He took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. Verse 24, And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpah, his, handmaid, his maid, for a handmaid. Now, I've heard people talk about, like, how did he do this? <coughs> Anybody ever thought about that? Never thought about, like, how is he able to, like, slide this one by? Shoot me a theory, maybe, of what somebody thinks. A veil, a veil that's possible. Anything else? Exactly. If I had to bet, that's what I think. Every other time when somebody in the Bible, something like this happens with, with some sort of intercourse, do you know what's going on? There's drinking involved. Do you know what's going on at the feast? It's a very good possibility. Now, I don't know this. This is a possibility. But it's with the, the themes of the Bible, it happens very often. It happens very often where people feast they get married. When David wanted to send his wife down, his uh, Uriah, to go sleep with her, what did he do? Made him drunken. When, hit, when the two daughters of Lot wanted to cause their father to sleep with them, what did they do? Got him drunk. Repeatedly, you see this cycle in the Bible. You know what Laban could have done to Jacob? It's possible, because we see that Laban is a very grimy guy. And Jacob's not the greatest, if you keep that in your mind. He could have, you know, put the bottle to his neighbor's lip, like the Bible talks about. He could have gotten him drunk and why? To look on his nakedness. In that case, it wouldn't have been him. It would have been just, he knows what people do when they... Why does it say that in, in I believe, what is it, Hosea? Why does it... In Habakkuk, yeah, Habakkuk. Why does it say that in Habakkuk? Because it, it, they're, they're talking about, if you give someone alcohol, it promotes lasciviousness. That's the point. So in this case, if lasciviousness is about to be gendered or birthed, 
It's going to take place. We see a theme all throughout the Bible. What do people do constantly? Hey, here's a bottle. What do you, you know what that means? What can you learn from that? If that is possible, but you don't know that for certain. Stay away from alcohol. Amen. Stay away from alcohol because that's what happened. Don't drink alcohol. This is what happens. This is a possibility of what took place here. It's, it's, it's a theme all throughout the Bible. I always thought maybe, I remember when I had heard, because I grew up in Christian schools, I grew up in church, and I had heard about this story tons of times. And I, I remember when I was a kid, I always thought, well, feast, weddings, they take place at night. It might have been just dark. I thought, man, that'd be really hard. Like, you know this woman really well. Seven years. Seven years. To try to, and you're totally sober, try to make this swap. That'd be, that'd be amazing. I mean, it had to be pitch black the entire time when he sees her from when they get into the, wherever, the tent, the house. That's kind of far-fetched to me. I mean, that's possible. And it could have been the veil. That's possible. But what makes more sense is that he put the bottle to his neighbor's mouth. That's what makes more sense. Look at verse, um, look at verse, where are we at now? <coughs> 25. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this thou hast done unto me? <coughs> Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Now I want to pause right there and point out something extremely interesting. So there is a theme throughout the Bible. The Bible says in Galatians 6 that whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. There's a theme throughout the Bible where, where God will cause a punishment to come upon someone and it is exactly what they had done wrong to someone else. I mean, you can see this so many times. I mean, repeatedly all throughout the Bible. You have it with Mordecai. And it's exactly where God is an exactor. You have it with Mordecai uh, and, and Haman. Where Mordecai gets all of the rewards that Haman was going to receive. And Haman gets all of the punishments that he was trying to put upon Mordecai. He's to the point where he's hanged on the very same gallows. The book of Psalms will talk about, it's David writing, where he will speak about repeatedly, hey, they fell in the snare that they set for me. They fell in their own trap. They fell in their own snare. He'll say that repeatedly over and over and over again. The, uh, the, uh, the children of Israel, they didn't uh, celebrate the, 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 uh, the Sabbath. The, the, what is it called? What's the last one? What is that called? I hadn't thought about this in a while. The Jubilee. Yeah, they hadn't cel celebrated. It was every seven for 70 years. 70 times particularly, you know what God did? He said, hey, I'm taking you away into the land of Babylon. And you know how long? 70 years so the land can rest. He's an exactor. He does this all. There are so many examples where God will bring the exact punishment of what someone else, even the law in and of itself in the Bible, there's a law. Hey, if you lie about someone and you want this to happen to this person and you're caught that you're actually deceiving and this is not true? Well, whatever that punishment is, let's say that it's murder, then you're put to death. Now it's flipped back around on your head. So we'll notice that when <coughs> someone has set a plot to deceive someone or to give a... a <coughs> to, to deceive someone or let's say that they do something wrong to someone, oftentimes that same wrong thing will come back around on their head. Pharaoh is a perfect example as well. Pharaoh was killing all of the, the firstborn children. A lot of people think he was drowning them if you compare that to, to a couple of other passages. Well, you get to the end of you know, uh, the story of Pharaoh and how does he die? He drowns himself, doesn't he? So We see this repeatedly where if someone will do something that is unrighteous, especially the wicked very often times, to, to another person, that they will receive that same punishment as of what they did to the other person. Well, here, <clears throat> what we see happening is <coughs> Jacob basically receiving a punishment, isn't he? He's not receiving what he worked for. He's receiving, I mean, this is bad. I don't know if you, you know, he goes along with this and there's no way really to get out of it. I mean, it's Laban's land. It's all of his, you know, property, all of this. You know, it's his daughters. He ends up obviously consummating the marriage with Leah and then, and that was seven years that he labored, which he thought he was going to receive Rachel, and he's given Leah. And he ends up laboring, again, we're going to read this, another seven years to get Rachel. How many years of his life is that? 
That's, that's almost 15 years of his life. It's 14 exactly. That is a long, long time, my friend. That is a, a serious waste of your life, isn't it? To the point of where he's, he leaves immediately. Now, what was the reason why Laban says that he did it? Now, what Laban did was wicked as well. <clears throat> but what was the reason why Laban says that he did it? Because, hey, he's like, it's for the firstborn, man. Firstborn needs to be given away. How did Jacob get... What did Jacob... How did he get to where he is today? And what did he receive and what he's known for? Esau's what? Birthright. Who is it for? It's for the firstborn. What about the blessing? It's for the firstborn. Now, was, were those things rightfully his? They weren't, were they? How did he get them? By what? Supplanting, deceiving, or... Like it says at the end of 25, what Laban did to him, beguiling. And he takes it and he's like, hey, that's for the firstborn. So notice how this works out. Well, we see this same theme all throughout the Bible. And it's hard you know, to, 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 to not imagine that God's hand's not in this at all. Oftentimes when God will send in even a wicked nation, he'll use that, 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 that country and just send them in and just let them loose and let them do whatever they want. And horrible, wicked things would happen, right? That doesn't mean God dreamed that up and he's not, you know, the author of that. But he just, hey, this nation over here, they're going to come and destroy you because of everything that you've done. And he'll send and horrible, wicked, wicked things would happen. But that was their punishment for all of the wickedness that they had done. This seems to be the same thing. Laban was an idol worshiper, we'll see later. He's a very wicked, evil man. He was a very, very bad person. So what is Jacob's name? referring to him being a supplanter, him beguiling. How did he get what he is, he is so well known for? The nation of Israel, the, you know, uh, the, uh, the birthright and the blessing. He was the, he was the second because he beguiled the firstborn. Well, here, guess what? Now, we're going to make sure that we, you get the firstborn this time. Or the first, firstborn gets it this time, right? And who is it? It's Leah. Let's make sure that the firstborn gets what they're supposed to get here, Jacob. And then he gets Leah for seven years. You may think, oh, that's not that big of a, uh, a deal. Then your life doesn't mean very much to you. Because that's 14 years of his life that's gone. Right. Which it would have been seven. That's seven years. That's basically God. Oh, you said that's not that big of a deal. Okay, well, you're going to live to be... Uh, you would have lived to be 84. But God goes ahead and shaves off seven years of your life. Now you're going to live to be 77. It's basically the same thing. He's just seven years just wasted of his life. It's a major punishment. So you can see how this would be. It would make a lot of sense if this was uh, a, a inherent punishment because of the wickedness that he had done. And God, again, being an exactor. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He's an exactor. He'll give you exactly what you have done to someone else or what you deserve. Look at verse number 27. Watch what Laban says here. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. So we can see he's a very, he's like a grimy salesman is what he is. You know what I mean? He's like, hey, we got a lot more work to do around here. Fulfill her week too, and I'll give you the other seven years. When he's well aware that he promised or already covenant, covenanted with Jacob for Rachel, and then purposely supplanted and deceived him, he's like, now, hey, I'm going to get seven more years of work or labor out of you. We know that he was very profitable and that God blessed the land because of Jacob's sake. Look at verse uh, 28. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. Another tool, and we're not turning to these because they're not necessarily pertinent to where we're at right now. So it is you know, uh, uh, very important to keep these in your mind. No, in your mind. Notice it says fulfill her week. How long was the time? Seven years. Where else does this kind of concept come up? The book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. This helps you define. This is very important because it helps you define that week that it's talking about. It's 70 weeks. It helps you define it as what? Seven years when it's one week. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in the midst of the week, we talk about how long is the tribulation. It's three and a half years we, talk, we hear talked about. Another three and a half years are talked about, right? It talks about in the midst of the week. It's in the midst of the what? Seven years. There's seven year period. We can see that defined right here. It's a perfect way. If somebody ever asked you, because you know, sometimes in the Bible, you, you know, you, you've heard it taught, you know what it's talking about, but you can't remember like, what is the verse that how I can prove that? Because I, I know that I know because everything, it breaks down. I know I've heard it preached before. This is where it's at. This is a perfect example of it. You can, of course, 
Show also three and a half years, three and a half years, missed of the week. That's another way to do it. That's kind of like uh, 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 reverse engineering though. You're putting it together. Here actually you have the definition. Seven, seven years, one week. This is, this is better than that. This is a de definition. One week equal, equals uh, seven years. <laughs> Look at verse, uh, this is how the Bible defines itself. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Something so random like that. There's no way that, that, that this book is written by man. So, it's so, so random. And then you get to Daniel. And it refers to it thinking, and this is, this is just presupposing. It, just, it doesn't tell you in the book of Daniel exactly how long it is. It just presupposes like God's like, you, you should have already read Genesis. And then you'd know how long a week is. Yeah, so that, the, the Bible's an amazing book. Amen. Look at verse... Uh, <clears throat> 28, and Jacob did so and fulfilled her week and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. So can you imagine this? He waited another seven years. Also that tells you that he cared a lot about Rachel. Now whether it was for the wrong reasons or not, <coughs> he cared a lot about Rachel. We should have love for our wives like Jacob loved Rachel. Where you would be willing to serve for her for seven years. Amen. You'd be willing to do whatever you had to do you know, to get her back or to have her. That's the attitude. You know, the Bible talks about how important a wife is. Sometimes you take for granted, you know, she's, she's meant to be a help meet for you, a help fit for you. And you take for granted all the things that get done around the house. You take for granted <clears throat> all the things that, that you come home and the house is just clean. You guys ever seen that commercial? It's kind of a bad spot to put this in. Maybe it's like a little like two minute clip on YouTube. Where there's this guy where he's got, it's, it's you know... There's a lady living with him, and he's like, she's been living with him for like two years or something like that, and he's, it's the, it's the same concept, right? It's worldly, but I think it's, it might even be, I don't know where I saw it exactly. Maybe somebody posted it on Facebook, but he's like, uh, he's, she's like complaining like, hey, you know, I'm going to be leaving because, you know, you're not doing any dishes, you're not doing any laundry, and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa stop right there. They have like, a, like an accent of like, it sounds like New Zealand, and he's like, let me show you something. And he like gets the, uh, like all these dishes together and he takes them into the kitchen and he puts them in the sink. And he's like, <clears throat> you're probably going to think I'm crazy. But I think you guys know where this is going. And he's like, all I do is I just take the dishes and I put them in the sink. And then I wake up the next day and they're done. I have no idea how this is happening. And she's like, you are, and he's like, oh, hold on a minute. He's like, come with me. And he like gets all of his dirty laundry. And he like puts, I don't remember where he puts it, but he like puts all of his dirty laundry or something like that. And he's like, you know, he's like, all I do is I just put them in here. And then I just wake up the next day and they're folded and they're clean. He's like telling her to just start doing this, basically. Yeah, so obviously that's a world example. But that's a, <coughs> there's a perfect <coughs> application from there, right? You, you don't realize. If, if, if your wife was just became incapacitated for whatever reason, you'd start realizing how much work and how much worth your wife really has just even around the house and all the things that she does. If you had to take care of your kids in the way that your wife takes care of your, your children, you'd realize, man, there's a lot of worth and a lot of value to this lady. Amen. If you had to do all the things that she does all day, and had to put up with yourself. I know in my case that's definitely true. You know, having that, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy life. The life of a wife and the life of a mother is not easy. So you know what you need to do? You need to not take it for granted. You need to have the love that Jacob had for Rachel. Where he's, he was willing to serve seven years, 14 in total for his wife. That shows that the love that he had for his wife was great. He, yeah, he might have had wrong reasons, but even still, have the, have the same amount of love, the same you know, scale of love for the right reasons, my friend. Love your wife for the right reasons. Value your wife in a great way. Because if she died tomorrow, I'm sure you'd be missing her. If she just fell off the face of the earth, you'd be missing her. So you, what you need to do <coughs> is value her. Love your wife. Care for your wife. Treat your wife well. Be thankful and understand that God made her for you. You know, uh, I think I might have told you this before. A preacher that I like a lot used to come and preach while I was growing up all the time as an evangelist. Uh, his name is Phil Skipper. And that guy's burned for the rest of his life now. But he, he's, a, he's a great guy. He used to always refer to his wife 
as his rib. You remember that? Always. Like every time he calls her, he's talking about my rib over there. My rib. When he's in conversation with you, he talks about my rib. Obviously talking about his wife being made in the same manner as, as Eve was made for Adam. Like a direct creation. That's the attitude you should have about your wife. Think about her like as being, you know, people talk about your soulmate, which that's not a biblical concept. It's definitely not. But you know what? If you find a wife, you've obtained favor of the Lord. Adam found a wife and he obtained favor of the Lord. She was made to be a helpmate. Treat your wife in that way. That, it's, that, it's, she, that she is you know, uh, uh, um, you know, far above rubies as far as her value. Love your wife in that way. Have that attitude. Have the great love that Jacob had for Rachel. Have that for your wife. Look at verse... Uh, <clears throat> look at verse... Where do we leave off? 28? We read down further. 30? 31. Okay. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Verse 32. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Excuse me. Now therefore my husband will love me. I preached a sermon one Sunday night uh, about the stranger, the fatherless, and the poor. The widows, the afflicted. God, you see, always has a, a heart or He has compassion on the afflicted. Those that are oppressed. You remember when God heard the nation of Israel when they were in Egypt was when? He said He heard their cries. Why? Their affliction, their oppression came up under Him. He cares for those that are hurting. He cares for those that are having trouble or, in, or having problems in their life. So we should, we should try to mimic that same behavior, same uh, uh, um, attitude, mentality that God has and care for those that are hurting. And, uh, you know, have empathy on those people. Uh, we see that God does that as well. Not only that, what do we see here? We see that having children is a blessing. Having children is a blessing. How did he cheer her up? He gave her a child. When you, when you look at Hannah, what cheered her up? Having a child. Having a child is a blessing. You know, people look down on having kids today. Having children is a blessing. Having children is not a curse. It's the opposite of a curse. It's a blessing. That's what God gave her. He saw her affliction. He wanted to give her something to give her happiness. He gave her a blessing. He gave her a child. This also uh, seems to me that not only because of the affliction, but also maybe Leah was more righteous than, than Rachel as well. Look at verse... Um, uh, we'll read verse 32. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Doesn't that make you feel kind of bad for Leah as well? It does. Every time I read that, I feel you know, sorry for her. Look at verse 33. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard <coughs> that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. It's interesting that she even knows that this is why God is doing this. So, let me ask you this question. <clears throat> Was Leah unaware of the animosity that Jacob had towards her? No, it says, she's saying, the Lord hath heard that I was hated. Do you know what that means, how she felt about her husband? She felt that Jacob hated her. She says, the Lord hath heard that I was hated. He hath therefore given me this son also. So, you, you see the, the attitude that Jacob... Now, he shouldn't have multiplied his wives in the first place. He should have just stayed with one woman is what he should... Now, what Laban did, of course, was wrong. And, of course, actually in the case of what, what took place with Leah, that would fall under an example of what's listed in the book of Deuteronomy. It's in Exodus, well, Exodus and Deuteronomy, where, you know, uh, it talks about if a man goes in under her and he hates her and finds some uncleanness in her along those lines. I would say that that goes in in that type of situation. You know, you may disagree with that, but my personal judgment, I would say that that would fall in that situation. The whole point is that you go in and then you find out, hey, this is not the way that I thought it was. He was deceived. He was beguiled. The, the marriage is not necessarily... That would have been the consummation of the marriage. So, my personal opinion is that he could have said, hey, you know, this was, this was wrong, this shouldn't have happened, this was wicked, you know, this is not what I expected, you know, I have been deceived, and he could have served the other seven years in that case, you know, but obviously then, then he would have had to wait, wait it even, if he would have done that and Laban would agree with that, he would have had to wait it seven years first for Leah, because of what Laban is supposedly saying. If, and, and, and it sounds like, you know, if, if people are only concerned about looks, that would have taken forever, possibly. She may have never been married off. So, maybe he kept Leah. Maybe it wasn't an option, or maybe he kept Leah just so that he could 
work the other seven years and get you know, Rachel immediately. So that's a possibility. You could see that. But you see the fact that Jacob, it was obvious that Jacob hated her. So on top of, so he's just building sin upon sin, on top of having a multitude of wives, he's just like, just wickedly treating one of his, one of his wives, one of his women. You know, which is, which is horrible. It's terrible, you know, what he's doing here. To the point of where she realizes that she's hated. Obviously, the, the situation is not the same with you having one wife or anything like that. But you sometimes will see men where they will grow like this animosity towards their wife. And obviously, that's, that ought not to be so. We should love our wives like Jacob loved Rachel. That's how we should care for our wives. This is horrible. I feel terrible for Leah when I read this every time. Look at verse 34. <clears throat> And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Le Levi. So notice what she's seeking. Just all she wants is the approval of her husband. Every time she gets a son, what does the name have to do with? Her relationship that she has with Jacob, her bad relationship. Talks about God looking upon her affliction and, and the first child, Reuben. That's what it means. Simeon means that he hath, hurt, he hath given me this son also because he had, he knew that I was hated. And then number three, son, is now my now my husband will be a, will be joined in me. She's saying finally now that I've had, I've borne him three children, he's finally going to love me. So you know what she's seeking? Just the approval of her husband. It's horrible. Look at look at the uh, verse thirty five. And she conceived again and bear a son. And she said, <coughs> Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. That's what Judah means. It means praise. And it's not a coincidence, of course, that Jesus came from the line of Judah when the, when the, the um, blessings are given to all of them. It talks about how thy brethren will praise thee because his name is Judah that falls in with that. And who is that specific promise given to? Christ who came of the line of Judah and his brethren praise him. Right? Talks about in the midst of the congregation I will sing praise unto thee. And actually it's the verse right before that and I can't remember how it's quoted but it called, I'm, he is not ashamed to call us brethren. So we're his brethren and what do we do? We praise him. That's why that promise is given to Judah. It says thy brethren shall praise thee and it lines up perfectly with the name that she gives Judah of which line Jesus comes which is praise. So he's the seed of, you know, the tribe of Israel in that case too. So even that is true because we're of spiritual Israel. But the last point I want to end on real quick <coughs> is this. How many kids did she have so far? She had four children. People constantly, you know, ask you, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Right? People ask you that question constantly. We had today, we went through Costco right before we came here today. And this guy's like, uh, yeah, we, 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 he's, he's like giving a sample. And we're like getting the sample. He's super nice. He says a couple things. He's like one of those like fast shooters. He's like coming at me with all kinds of stuff, just joking around. And he's like, I gotta ask you though, what is it? And I'm like, what is he getting ready to say? I can tell. Because he like waited and he like looked at me. And he's like, Catholic, hippie, or Mormon? Huh? Huh? And I'm like, none, we're Baptist, you know. So everywhere you go, we're walking in. <coughs> Jessica was like, Did you see that guy? Did you see that guy? And I was like, no, I didn't see him. <coughs> She's like, he's like turning around, looking at you, looking at me, and he's got like this super weird look on your face. It is so odd to people that you have multiple children. Do you know how many kids I'll have? I have as many. You know, when it's telling you here, and she conceived again, why did she conceive the first time? Go back. I have to flip back. You may not have to. Look at verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, what's it say? He opened her womb. What happened? She conceived. The Bible, the Bible teaches that God opens and closes the womb. I have as many, many kids as God will give me. Amen. And that's not a burden. That's a blessing. Right. I'll be thankful for every single child that I have. And I'll be happy with that. And you know what? If we were to go back just one century, even half a century ago, my father just from literally the pre... Obviously, he's my father the previous generation had nine brothers and sisters. Nine. You know... There, yeah, yeah, he had nine brothers and sisters. I was, gonna, I was thinking, is it nine total? No, it's nine brothers and sisters. That's just one generation back. You skip forward, you know, just 35 gap year period. Obviously, it's, it's more years than he was born, but 35 roughly when I, when I was born, I think he was like 32 or something. Just one generation gap. You walk into a store and people are like, you are out of your mind. When it was normal, just... Just one generation ago. 
It shows you that people just allow the popular opinion to run their mind. They think, you guys are so weird. You know if they would have been living 70 years ago, you know what they'd say? You guys only want one child? Why are you only having one child? Don't allow the world to make your mind up. Don't look around at popular opinion and allow popular opinion to be your opinion. Look at what the Bible teaches. Get everything you believe from the Bible. The Bible does not teach that children are a curse. The Bible does not teach that children are a burden. The Bible teaches that they're a blessing. The Bible talks about, it being, about children being a blessing repeatedly. So we should love every single child that God gives us and be thankful and happy and don't do anything to prevent it. Allow God to close the womb if He sees fit. If I have 15 children, that's because God opened the womb 15 times and caused my wife to conceive. And I'll be happy and grateful and thankful for every single one that He gives me. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank You so much for, for Your Word. We thank You for all the guidance that's given in it. We thank You for all the good and bad decisions that people make that we can glean and learn wisdom from. We ask You to be with us and bless us. Help us uh, to continually to, to study and love Your Word. Help us to love our wives. Help us to, to carry all these truths with, uh, with us and not forget them but to just uh, to understand the importance of all the truths that we can learn from your word. Be with us tonight and keep us safe. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. <clears throat>